Good morning. Before I get started today, I do want to say thank you to everybody that helped out at our winter giveaway yesterday. Um, someone texted me afterwards, said how many people came through, and I said I did not even count. Um, I don't know how many came through. Um, I just know that we gave away a lot of clothes, and uh, we helped a lot of people. And um, even one, one woman that came down, she was actually going to take blankets to the homeless in Randleman and uh, take clothes to the homeless, gloves. She needed gloves. She needed all types of things for the homeless in Randleman. So um, I want to thank you for serving yesterday. I want to thank you for donating. I want to thank you for unpacking all those bags so that Pastor Elisa and Randy didn't have to. Um, yes, she says hallelujah for that because that was a lot. There was a lot to go through. Uh, we had a lot of clothes, but just want to thank you for that. Um, what was amazing to me was the people that we are seeing um, going back to over the summer, last summer, when we were feeding people every Saturday. A lot of those people came, and they said, it's, it's us again. And um, we were able to talk with them, and we recognized them. Even one called me yesterday, and she said, can you all hold it? And I says, I know who you are now. And she said, you're the pastor, aren't you? That's, she's never been to our church. She's never been in our church on Sunday morning. She's never attended our church, but she knows us, and we know her. And um, that's what it's about, about building the relationships with people in our community, um, with the prayer, with the hope that they will come to see Jesus and come to know Jesus through us and through our love. They said they know us by our love. That's what Jesus said. And I pray that they know that we love them and that God loves them through the events that we do, the outreach events that we do. We're going to continue our series today um, called More. This is our word for the year. This is the word that God laid on my heart. That, and, and we talked about how it meant multiple things, but we talked about how we need more of God in our life. Uh, we need more of God in our world for sure. We talked about how God deserves more of us and that we must give more of ourselves to God. And we talked about how God wants to do more through us. I want to go through each one of those um, over the next few weeks um, and talk about them in a little more depth about what I believe God wants to do, what, what I believe God wants us to do. But first, we need to take this first one and, and pay attention to this first one. Today's focus is that we need more of God. Have you ever thought about the things that you could use more of? I was just thinking, uh, this, this is how God led me to start the sermon. What could I use more of? Well, more time in the day to get things done. How about more money? Amen. And for some of you, including myself, I could use some more sleep, some more rest. I got more out of sleep than money. But how often do we think about needing more of God? When I say more of God, I'm talking about more of God's love, more of God's grace, and more of God's power at work in our life. How often do we think about needing more of everything that comes from being in the presence of God? I would say not often enough. And yet that may be why we are in the situation that we are in today in our society is because we as the church, we as God's people, we don't think about how much more of God we need in our life. We don't think about, we, we kind of become complacent. I was looking at people complaining about the United States of America, about the world, about society, about the culture around us this past week on Facebook, and the whole time I'm thinking, the blame lays at the feet of the church. It's, it's, it's up to us to be the light of the world, to be the salt and the light. That's what Jesus has told us to be, and we're going to cover that in the last week. But if we as the church don't realize our need for more of God in our life, then why should we expect the world to realize that? If the church has become complacent, well, how do we expect the world not to come out of this complacent um, path that they are on. See, I think one of the problems that we are seeing right now is that, and really the church has always struggled with this, with being self-righteous. A self-righteous person is defined as one who is confident in his or her own goodness 
our own rightness. A self-righteous person thinks that they are superior to others, especially if they have a different opinion than theirs. And we're seeing this take place in the church today. We have become self-righteous. We think that we're fine. We think that we know everything. We think that our position, um, even, and, and don't get me wrong, our positions that line up with the word, that is truth, and we can be sure that that is right. But there are things that we are claiming is right that does not line up with the word. There are things that maybe the word does not address specifically that it's just our opinion, but we're taking that opinion as if it is the gospel, as if it is right. In church, it's not what we should be, it's not what we have been called to. And so what I want us to look at over these next few weeks is the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. These are the teachings that Jesus made to his followers at the beginning of one of his most influential sermons, which was the Sermon on the Mount. These are teachings that Jesus made to his followers about the character they should display. Jesus' goal in teaching these things to his followers was that he would help them to go to the next level in their walk with him. And each statement included a blessing with it. And so we can read this as if he was teaching it to us today as followers of him, if we claim to be a follower. And so I want us to look at the first three today. And you will see that these first three, they fight this self-righteous view that people often have of themselves. And I want to talk to you about three things that we must realize to help us understand that we need more of God. First thing I want you to think about is that we must realize that we are broken. We must realize that we are broken. And I changed the wording a little bit this morning because I had there that we must realize that we all are broken. Every person in this room, every person listening online, we are broken at the core of our being. Jesus said here in Matthew 5, 3 through 5, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So basically God is telling church people, he's telling us as Christians that we need to be these three things. We need to be poor in spirit. We need to mourn, and we should be meek. And so I want to explain those three to help you realize that we need to realize that we are broken. Number one, the poor in spirit. What does that mean? This means that we are to be in spiritual poverty. That we are to be in a state where we are aware of our own need for God. We're not placing our hope within ourselves. We're placing our hope in God. Those that claim to be followers of God should recognize our continual need for him in our daily lives. That we need him to live the life that he has called us to live. That we need him to save us. We need his blood. We need his mercy. We need his love. We need his grace and we need his power at work in our lives. And so Jesus said that we should be poor in spirit. But what does the world teach us? The world teaches us to be independent, be who you want to be, be proud of who you are. Tells us that everything we need in our life to live the good life here on earth, we possess within us. Yet Jesus said that we are to be poor in our spirit. We are to live in the spiritual poverty. See, Scripture teaches us in John chapter 15, Jesus talked about, I think this is one of, I keep going back to this in my mind, that he is the vine and we are the branches. And we can bear no fruit separate from him. He's basically trying to help us to realize, just like a branch that's broken off of a vine, it can do nothing separate from that vine. The vine is what what provides it with all the power to produce the fruit. We are like those branches that separate from God, we are nothing. And so we must come to God, we must approach our spiritual life as if we are spiritual beggars. Continually going to God, begging him to give us what we need. 
because we are broken people. I was thinking of applying it to beggars, uh, like a beggar that we see on the side of the road. I think oftentimes we approach our relationship with God as if we, know, we, we don't have money, we don't have what we need, whether we realize it or not. We don't have what we need, but we have God over here saying, so let's, let's just use someone that needs food or money, for example. And let's say they're up here, I know there's been some at Walmart here recently, just at the end of Walmart. Let's say that we, Jesus comes and says, I will provide you with everything you need. And you're sitting there saying, no, I've got what I need. I'm fine. I don't need no money. I don't need no, I don't need no food. I don't need nothing. I'm fine. When really, they're not eating. They're not living the life that they could live. They have no money. They're poor. That's how we often approach God. We, God is saying, I can provide you with everything you need. And you're just like, I don't need it. I'm fine. Jesus says we need to come to him like we are beggars, just begging him to give us everything we need. That come with this, this sense that we are poor in spirit. And we can go to the one who can give us everything we need. He's there. He wants to provide it. He, he desires to provide that for you. But we don't go to him. We don't approach him like that. I was thinking about how many times Jesus uh, talked about prayer, and oftentimes he would come from this standpoint of basically begging God in prayer. Sarah and I say our nightly prayers, and um, it feels repetitive at times. I'm praying for the same group of people about every night. But you know what? I'm begging God to move in that person's life. I'm begging God to break those chains. I'm begging God to heal them. We pray for our future children. Praying for their salvation. Praying that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that people would come to know Him through them, through their life. And it feels like I'm being repetitive, yet Jesus said, just keep coming back to God. Just as a beggar keeps coming back begging for food because they know that they, they're, they're about to lose their life if they do not receive what they need. We need to approach God as if we are beggars in need of what he has because we are. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Now this specifically refers to being saddened by the things that sadden God. And one thing that saddens God is that God grieves over the sin and darkness that is present in our world. The sin and the darkness that we see in the world. The things that we see on the news. The things that we see celebrated uh, in our nation and celebrated in the world. That should grieve us because it grieves God. It saddens God. It should cause us to mourn. Yet the world tells us to focus on being happy. Do whatever makes you happy. The world tells us... Um, that we need to focus on making sure that, that we are doing what we want to do. No matter if it lines up with the word of God, just as long as it makes you happy. As long as it makes you feel good. As long as it makes you feel good about yourself, it's fine. And we see that the world celebrates the things that cause God to mourn. It should not be that way with us, church. We should mourn over the sin in this world and you know, I think there's a sense that we can become numb to the sin in the world. We see so much of it that um, when we hear about an abortion, we don't mourn like we should. Um, when we see homosexual marriage being celebrated, we don't mourn like we should. We should be saddened by the state that our world is in and that our culture is in. We can't fall into the trap of celebrating the things that cause God to mourn. We have to realize, church, that we live in a broken world that is in need of God. We're broken, we need God. Our world's broken, it needs God. Sometimes I wonder if God allows things like the pandemic and some of the other things that we're going through today in, in our nation in our world sometimes I, I wonder if God continues to allow things like that to happen to make us realize that we need him to maybe get the, the church down on their knees praying that God would move praying begging God that he would move 
and to make us mourn. Finally, he says, blessed are the meek. Now, meek here means humble, and some translations actually translate it as humble. Blessed are those who are humble. Tony Evans said, meekness does not mean weakness. He says instead that we must be humble enough to recognize that we can't do life alone. And once again, we must recognize that we need him. We need God. We need Jesus. Now, the world tells us the exact opposite once again. Be proud of who you are. Chart your own course. You don't need anyone telling you how to live. You don't need anyone telling you what to do. Church, it should not be that way. We should be humble. We should um, submit ourselves underneath God's rule and God's reign in our life. And we're about to get to that, um, talking about the kingdom of God. See, I was thinking through this, and I've never thought like this before, but God laid this on my heart, and I want to share it with you. See, the problem with this type of thinking about charting your own course, being proud of who you are, all this, is that God designed life, and he is the one we should look to to help us live it. How many of us men like to make things without reading the directions? <laughs> yep. I see Tim. Tim's admitting. He's like, yep. I built things before I was thinking about, uh, we have like a fireplace thing at our house. I remember building it and then something else. I don't remember what the other thing was. And uh, of course I did it wrong. Of course I didn't want to use the directions. And so when you, when you go about it without the directions, sometimes it doesn't turn out the way that it was designed to be. But see, the designers gave us the direction so that the product is, the, is what it was designed to be in the first place. It's the same way in our life. God is the designer, and we need to follow his directions. He is giving us the outline here in Scripture of what our life should look like, how our life should be, and we need to realize that we can't go about building our life based off what we think we should do. We need the designer's directions to live the good life, to live the life that God has called us to live. And so we must realize that we are broken to the point that we need God to give us those directions. We need to humble ourselves underneath God's mighty hand because without him, there is no hope for us. So we must realize that we are broken. The second thing I want us to realize today is that we can recover. We must realize that we can recover. And I want to go through these same three uh, verses again to show you what we recover when you realize that you are these three things. So Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he says what we're recovering here is the kingdom of God. He says that for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Basically what that means is that we can be a part of God's kingdom. Now, God's kingdom here refers to God's rule and God's reign. We know that there are two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom, and then there's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil. And we know the end of the book tells us the only one's going to be left standing in the end. And we have the choice to make. Which kingdom are we going to be a part of? We were never meant to be part of the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of darkness. And so... I want to explain why I'm using the word recover here, that we can recover. To recover something means to regain it. See, we were created and designed to live in a certain way by God. And one of the aspects of our design is that we are designed to live under the direction of God or under the rule of God. He was to be our guide, our teacher, our Lord, and our ruler. Because as we know, if we, if we don't have someone to tell us what to do, what we make ends up not being what it was designed to be. Adam and Eve chose to do something that God told them they should not have done. And that created chaos. And we're living in that chaos today. We were cast out from God's kingdom, not because he didn't want us, but because we chose to live contrary to his rule. 
So Jesus teaches us here that those that realize that they are broken, those that realize that they are poor in spirit, those that realize they need to live under God's rule and God's reign, they will receive the kingdom of heaven. That we will recover the lost state of living under the reign and rule of God. That we will be accepted back into the kingdom, which is how we were meant to live in the first place. But as long as we live outside of his rule and reign, we will continue to create chaos. We will continue to create a mess. We will continue to mess up creation. But as long as we live under his rule and reign, we bring about the life he desired for us and for the people around us. Right now, many people are not living under his rule and reign. But church, we must choose to today. And that starts with being poor in spirit, realizing that we need him, that we have to have him. Second thing, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now this is interesting. The word for comforted here comes from two words. The first word is para, and it means by the side of. The second word was kaleo, which means to call. So basically what Jesus is saying there is that those who mourn, they will be called to the side of who? God. And in God's presence, we're told in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, that there is peace. He tells us, Paul tells us in Philippians 4, he says, present your request to God, pray to God, ask God these things, and then know that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You will find comfort for the things that trouble you. You will find comfort and peace in the presence of God. And so what are we recovering? We're recovering our place in the presence of God. We were never meant. We are not created to live separate from God. When we live separate from God, we are missing things in our life. Uh, I heard someone talking a couple of weeks ago about we're trying to fill this hole, this void with all these things in the world. Some things just make us forget about the, the void for a few hours, for a few minutes. When God is the one, he is, that, he is the one who can fill that void with his presence. And so when we are separate, <laughs> we don't know what to celebrate and what to mourn. So don't be surprised when you see the world around you celebrating the things that God tells us to mourn. Don't be surprised when you see, um, I expect, in the, and I'm getting a little political here, but I expect in the next four years, I expect the White House is going to be light up in rainbow colors at some point. Don't be surprised by that. They don't surprise me. I expect culture to go down that path. I expect our nation to go down that path. But we, church, when we are in the presence of God, we need to know what to celebrate and what to mourn. But when we're separate, we don't know that. When we are separate from God's presence, we are forced to tackle life alone. We're forced to go through this pandemic alone. Some of these stats on the mental health in, 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 in America, in our world, people going through what they're going through, they're shocking and they're sad. I've had a couple conversations this past week, um, specifically talking about Moore County. Um, they've had teenagers commit suicide during this pandemic. The mental health um, crisis in America has only gotten worse. We need to be in the presence of God, because did you notice that Paul said there that he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus? But when we're separate, we're forced to tackle the things that come along in life alone. And so when things, don't, when things go wrong, we don't receive that peace and comfort that only He can give. I know many of us can look at how God's presence has kept us calm in this last year. How God's presence has um, forced us to react differently than how we would react outside of His presence, you know? I know I can, and I'm thankful for that. But when I saw the way that some of the people in the world was responding, 
um, I knew that that's how I would respond if I didn't have God with me. That's how I would respond if I didn't have God's presence and it with me that comforts and gives me peace. And so know that, that in God's presence, when we mourn, and we say, for they will be comforted, or they will be called to the side of, to be beside of God, to be with God. So many people are in need of that peace and comfort today. Some of the things I'm seeing people say, um, even in this past week, they're saying out of this personal pain that they have experienced, and they're saying out of fear. Um, a lot of fear-mongering going on right now on Facebook. A lot of pushing things to cause people to be afraid, but I don't think that's their intention. I think it's, they're talking out of the fear that's within their hearts as well, which makes me wonder if they're not receiving the comfort that can only come from God. Because I'm seeing like two separate m responses in the church, the local church, uh, Randolph County people, I'm seeing two different responses. Some of them saying, you know what, we're going to trust God over these next few years. We're going to believe that God is with us, that God's going to work in us, and they just have this peace about themselves. And then I see some pushing fear, pushing, um, pushing us, I think, to try to act. I, and I don't know what, necessarily what we can do, um, but I think they're talking out of this place of fear of themselves. Because they're not receiving the comfort that comes from God. Let's just mourn at the state of our nation. Let's just mourn at the state of our world and believe that God is up to something even when we don't see it. We sing on Sundays even when we don't see it, he's working. I know he's working. I know he's going to work through our church, through the church. But we need to realize we need him. We need to realize the brokenness in this world and realize that we can be comforted by the one that can the only one that can successfully address those problems, and that's God. Finally, he says, blessed are the meek, and so what do they recover? He says, they will inherit the earth. Now, this does not mean that you will own the earth. It means that they will inherit God's intention for their life here on the earth. They will inherit the benefits the blessings of belonging to God and being a part of his kingdom. So what do we recover here? We recover the life that God desired for us in the first place. We recover the, the life that he desired that we would have, which was a good life. We know in creation everything he created was good. And I believe that the life that he created for us would be good but we went out and brought evil into it. We went out and brought chaos into it. We went up and messed up his creation. Like us men do when we go without the directions. People think they live the good life outside of God. That's what the world tells them. The good life is going to the club, drinking as much alcohol as you want, getting drunk, coming home, going to the bars, uh, focus on all these other things. That's not the good life. You know, I have never come across a committed follower of God who desired their old life. Never. Those that are truly committed, those that have given their life over to God and are following God, actively following God in their, day, in, in their current day, I've never heard one of them say, hey, I wish I was going back to the clubs like I was in my 20s. I wish I was going back to live in that way the way I used to live. Never heard that. Yet I hear the people who are living that way saying they desire more, that they're depressed, that they're down, that they need something more. But those that humble themselves under God's rule, under God's reign, we're the ones who live the real good life, the good life that he desired for us in the first place. As a church, we must realize that we are broken. But we must also realize that we can recover what was lost because of Adam and Eve's sin. But you know, just knowing that we are broken and that we can recover, that's not enough. God calls us to respond. And so we must realize that we must respond. 
We read this verse last week, James 4, 7 through 10. I want to read more of it to you today, though. James tells us to submit yourselves then to God. What's he essentially saying there? Humble yourselves before God, and he's going to close with that as well. Humble yourselves underneath God. Humble yourselves underneath God's reign. Resist the devil. Don't live the way the world's telling you to live. Don't, don't live the way the devil's telling you to live. Resist him, and he will flee. He will go running. And he says, and come near to God, and he will come near to you. That's that comfort. That's, he will call you beside of. We can go into his presence and be comforted. And that's where we stopped last week. But let me read this. He says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He says, grieve. I wonder if he was thinking about Jesus' sermon here. Grieve, which is exactly what Jesus told us. Mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Stop celebrating the state that the world's in. Stop celebrating the state that your life is in. Instead, wash your hands, purify your hearts, give yourself other to God, uh, over to God, and then here he says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Submit yourselves underneath God's rule and God's reign, and he will lift you up. Not you charting your course, not you doing what you think is best to gain a, a, a step in the world today. God will lift you up. And you got to trust that he'll lift you up in his time, in his way, which might not be your way, but his way is better than our way. And so part of our response is coming near to God. We've got to be intentional about that. We've got to be intentional about going into God's presence, about taking time out of our day to spend time with him, taking time out of our day to pray, taking our time out of our day to read his word, to come near to him knowing that the God of the universe, the creator who designed your life and your body and this world will come near to you. And I don't know about you, but I want God to come near to me. I need God to come near to me. I don't deserve it, but I need it. So we need to come near to God. Number two, we need to come near to one another. We need to carry each other's burdens. I like the way Paul says this in Galatians 6 too. He says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ, which is to love. We have to carry each other's burdens. We need to come closer to one another. We need to support one another. We need to help one another through this life. I so believe that takes two actions for us. Number one, we've got to be willing to give our burdens to others to carry. And that's a big step for a lot of us. Going back to Pastor Lisa's um, message a few weeks ago, we've got to take our mask off. Our spiritual mask. Where we are pretending that we are something that we are not. We want our church people in particular to, make, to think that our life is perfect. That there's no sin, I'm good. When really, we sh this should be the place where we are transparent with one another. That we are authentic, that we are real. And so we've got to be willing to be honest and open with others. But then that comes with a second action. Those of us that people are open with, we must be willing to be a carrier as well. We must be willing to help other people carry their burdens, and what comes with that is that we must not judge them when we hear about it. God's really been working on me uh, since I started pastoring. Um, there's been a few conversations here in the last few weeks, and I was telling some of our um, leadership development folks the other day, that God has led me here in the last few years to take what I consider as a more fatherly approach, but just the approach God takes with us, so I guess I should have been doing this the whole time. <laughs> but there's this sense where I'm aware of some, some of the things that our people are struggling with in the church, even if they're not aware that I'm aware. But it's not caused me to look at them any different. And in fact, over the last month or so I've had people talk to me 
um, uh, uh, to, to confess to me what they're struggling with that I knew they were struggling with the whole time, but uh, they confessed to me what they were struggling with, and I told them, I said, well, I've known about it this whole time, but it didn't change my view of you. That I've still loved you through it. And I believe that that's that fatherly approach that we are called to take with one another. I'm not going to judge you, and I'm not going to say you're less of a Christian. I'm not saying that, that you're, you're, you should be, I'm not going to shame you for it. And we shouldn't shame one another. Instead, we must say, okay, thanks for telling me that. I'm willing to walk with you through this. However the Spirit leads. Whenever the Spirit leads. I've even learned there's some things that I'm against that the Bible is, is uh, and I'll just, let's straight up say it, alcohol. The Bible, it somewhat says some things about alcohol. Uh, Paul told Timothy that he could drink a little wine for her stomach. Um, my personal position and the West Church's position for years, and, and this is still my position, is that um, alcohol is dangerous, that there is a sense that it can lead people astray, that it can lead you astray, and um, yet I know the people in our church that drink alcohol, they don't know I know, but I know, but I don't look at them any differently. And the people that I've taken this approach with, God has gradually worked with them to the point where now they are being convicted for drinking any alcohol. And I heard today, and let's praise God for this, that it's been a week since they drank a drop. I believe that's an act that they took last week and that God is working in their life with. Now, I don't look at people that drink alcohol. In our church, we have members who drink alcohol. Westland Church actually changed their position a few years ago. You used to not be able to be a member and drink alcohol at all. Now we allow people who drink alcohol to become members, but they obviously can't get drunk because that is against the Bible. Um, but what I have trusted God with is that God will lead them in his timing along this sanctification process. And when I give him time to work, I'm able to walk alongside these people to help them as they walk towards that as well. And so um, I was not planning on saying that. That was not in the notes. But it's funny because when I ran through my sermon, this came to, this came to my heart and I uh, decided to go on with it today. Anyway, um, we must be willing to not judge others when we hear about what they're struggling with. We must not think that we are better than them because we're all broken. We all have sin in our life. We all have things that we, we don't need in our life. We are all broken in some aspect of our life, and we need God. And so we need to come near to God, come near to one another. But then the third thing, and it's a C, just because you know me. Um, we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate that we can recover in the first place. Because without God, without God sending his son Jesus, that we would be stuck in this wretched state of brokenness. That we would be stuck in a way, um, in, a, in a path, in a lifestyle that is not what he desired for us. And it's not the good life. But we need to celebrate that God has made a way for us to live the life he has called us to be called us to live and so what what I really want to communicate to you here is that when we gather here on Sunday morning it needs to be a celebration of what happens throughout the week when the church gathers together we should celebrate I was told that this morning that this 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 couple has went a, a week without drinking any alcohol and that's the celebration that we should be having today that God has taken them along this path where they feel convicted for it and that they have, they have taken this step. That's a celebration. So when we gather here together as a church family, when we gather here together as a church, we need to celebrate what God is doing in the life of our church through the week. And I'll be honest with you right now. We are full on pressing the problems our church is facing. I was thinking this past week, we're getting ready to launch all types of things over these next few weeks. You're going to hear about two ministries we're launching today. We're getting ready to start table gatherings back up. We just started men and women's Bible studies. We are full, we're doing a lot right now, and I, there is this sense I'm worried about wearing us out, yet 
I want to full on press the, the things that's going on in our church because I believe now's the season where God is leading us to give more of our life to him because he wants to do more through us. And so we're kind of, basketball term, we're, we're, we're putting a full court press on. But you know what? I believe that we're going to see God do some amazing things in our church over the next few months. And when God does something in your life, let's celebrate that together. When you experience a taste of the recovery that God desires for us, let's celebrate together as a church. But I can't celebrate when I don't know what you're going through. We can't celebrate with you when we're not open with one another. We need to be transparent with one another. We need to celebrate when we recover a little bit of the life that God desired for us this whole time. I've been using this language specifically because we're starting up a ministry called Celebrate Recovery here in two weeks. This is a ministry that was laid on mine and Andrea's and Stephanie's heart probably two years ago now. Um, I'll tell you, one of the things that started it was just hearing about the problems the people in our community are facing and the need um, for them to have a program that they can be a part of um, for us to be able to help them and them and for us to be able to walk with them through things. But to give you just a little information about Celebrate Recovery, it's a recovery program based on eight principles from the Beatitudes. And this group is going to be led by Stephanie Reeder and David Whitman. Our goal with this ministry is to be able to open it up to the community one day. Um, for example, yesterday when we're meeting these people and they're telling us what they're struggling with, I would love to be able to say, here's a card, we have Celebrate Recovery that meets here on Monday nights. And for them to come into a non-judgmental atmosphere, they're not going to walk in on church on Sunday. Uh, let's just be honest, around here they've walked in enough churches and got judged for not wearing the right clothes. Let's give them to come in on a Monday night, provide them some food, let's have a group, let's be open with one another. And so we want this to be a ministry that we're able to offer to people in this community who are struggling with drugs, alcohol, divorce, sexual abuse, all these things. I'm getting ready to read this list to you. But we need people in our church to go through this course over the next eight weeks. We need you guys to get familiar with it. We need you to go through it to not only help yourself, but so that you can help others. So that when we open it up to the community, let's say we start having 10 to 20 people come on Monday nights. Well, that's not enough. That's, that's too many people for two people to have very close relationships with. So if people in our church who have already gone through it can come in and build relationships with these people, they might be willing to open up one-on-one -on -one with you where they couldn't open up in a group of 10 to 20. And so we need people in our church to go through it, and I believe it will help you. Because once again, we are all broken in some sense. We all need to recover in some sense. And you might learn something that will help someone else recover. But we need you to go through it to not only help yourself, but also to help others as well. And so I'm just going to read to you um, what was on the front cover of this uh, study to tell you what it is for. This program is for people who are battling with alcoholism, divorce, sexual abuse, codependency, domestic violence, drug addiction, sexual addiction, food addiction, gambling addiction, or anything that causes us to stumble at times. I mean, that's that, that what the specific things were the, was the list that they gave us, but it's much more than that. It's going to be applicable to whatever you're struggling with, I believe. And so this group will be good for anyone in our church to go through. And so I want to encourage you to go through it. And simply how we want you to um, take part in this ministry or sign up to take part in this ministry is to just let Stephanie or David know. Just tell them, I want to, I want to come to that. It's going to be on Mondays at 7. It's going to be on Monday nights at 7. We might even pay for you to have pizza or something uh, to get you here. Um, but... Um, it's going on Monday nights at 7, and I know there's probably this sense where the devil's going to tell you, don't go. You're going to get shamed for going. You're going to get judged for going. No, you won't. And I was hoping me talking to you today and open up a little bit about some of the things that um, my personal convictions on things, um, but yet I know other people's personal convictions are not the same, that there's no judgment there. 
not that I look at them any differently. So I want to encourage you to go through that. I want to encourage you to sign up for it. Uh, talk, to, talk to Stephanie or David to sign up for it. Because we're all broken. And we're all in need of more of God. And This is one ministry, one avenue that we're offering for us to experience more of what God desires for our life. And so in recap, we must realize that we are broken. We must realize that we can't recover. And we must realize we must respond. So two responses that I want you to do today. Those of you that feel led, I want you to join Celebrate Recovery. Let them know today. Message them, text them, talk to them after service. Let them know today that you're going to be here uh, on February the 8th, uh, Monday night, February the 8th. Let them know you're coming so that we can order your book, order your study materials. But also, the second response I want us all to collectively do as broken people, I want us to recognize the one who was broken for us through the sacrament of communion. This is COVID communion. We've done it before like this. But here's how we're going to do it. These little packets here contain a piece of bread on the top. Bread represents the body of Jesus. That was broken for us. And so what we're going to have you do during this next song, we're going to have you, just a few of you at a time, starting from the front, heading towards the back, to come up here, take one, come over here, and Scripture tells us that we need to search our hearts, that we need to make sure that we have confessed everything to God, that we have, we are, we have made God aware of everything. I want us to confess to Him that we need Him. To recognize that we need him. But then by doing the act of communion, by, by taking part in the sacrament of communion, I want that to be you realizing that we can recover because the, he was broken for us, which is what the bread represents. And his blood was poured out for us, which is what the grape juice represents. So you're going to tear off this top flap here, take the bread, and then you just pull the whole thing up you take the juice, drink it, and there's trash cans on each side. Lisa's going to be where she's at now. I'm going to be where I am normally sit right there. If you need us to help you grab the top part off, because that's where the problem is most of the time, um, we will be right there, and we're going to take hand sanitizer, so we'll be able to do that for you and then hand it back to you. Um, but we're going to sing uh, a song, a mix of a, a hymn and, and um, a newer song, and I want us to respond saying, God, we're broken, but Jesus, thank you for being broken for us. We teach that the sacrament of communion, uh, there's a means of grace there. And basically what that means is that God works through this in our lives. This is an area where we can meet with God, and it's an area where God's grace can be poured into our lives so that we can leave this and live for him. But if you are not a follower of Jesus today, I implore you not to take it. Scripture tells us that we'll drink a judgment on ourselves if we are not uh, taking this seriously. If we're not a follower of him, if we have not confess all of our sins to him. So this will be done during the next song. So I want you to stand to your feet.